So, going through the agenda, I want to start by bringing some clarity around real-time. There seems to be lots of confusion around what is a real-time system, whether it is always necessary, the difference with low latency, whether it's actually needed for your specific use case or not. So, because there are several definitions of real-time and uh, the topic seems to be relatively controversial in the sense that there doesn't seem to be 100% agreement over the terminology, um, I want to give you some, some clarity and to set the context for what we mean by real-time. Then we look at the different uh, use cases and applications of real-time and there are several verticals where real-time can be applied. There are broad market applications. So this will be just a high-level overview to make you understand um, the wide reach that uh, the announcement of real-time Ubuntu is going to have in the coming months. Central to the whole concept of real-time is preemption. So we're going to discuss what preemption is all about, as well as the current uh, preemption modes available in mainline Linux, as well as their limitations. So why there is a need for um, a patch preemptor T that is not yet fully upstream. It is slowly being mainline, but it's not yet fully upstream. So we will take a look at um, the, the addition of preemptor T over the currently existing preemption modes. So the second part of this presentation will be a bit more involved, a bit more technical, as we will go through the details of preemption. And in the beginning, we will discuss the, um, it will be more introductory around the concept of real time, and what real time is not and um, its applications. We will conclude with, uh, with the announcement of a beta version of real time Ubuntu, how to enable the, the kernel, how to file bugs for the kernel, the current status of the kernel, and then um, try to clarify all the questions you may have at the end. So then we will have a Q&A. So feel free to drop any question in the chat. So let's get going. Um, Looking at this definition, the main thing that I want you to take out of the definition is the reference to the timing constraint. So a real-time system is a time-bound system, which is a well-defined, which is a fixed time constraint. If the real-time system is unable to service its um, real-time tasks within this specified upper boundary of time, if processing is not done within this defined constraint, then the system has failed. And this is the second part of the definition. So we have two key aspects. A time-bound, well-defined, fixed time constraint and performing the real servicing, the real-time tasks within those constraints. In case this is not possible, we have failure. Of course, this implies that we must be able to determine what is the worst case time for a given response time. Uh, essentially, this means that the operating environment required by real-time applications is deterministic by definition. So this is for a real-time system. Very related is the concept of real-time for an operating system. So let's look at the second definition as another way of wording the same concept. Uh, if you think of the response time of an application, it's essentially the time interval from when um, we receive a stimulus, which is provided by a hardware interrupt, to when the application has produced a result based on that stimulus. And the processing of time critical tasks, it depends on the capacity of the system to respond to the event within a known and bounded interval of time. So the first definition was for a real-time system, the second for a real-time OS. In the kernel, kernel context, real-time denotes a deterministic response to an external event. And the goal is to minimize the response time guarantee. So out of the definition, uh, let's try to keep in mind this idea of um, determinism, bounded response, a guaranteed response, a fixed constraint, and failure in case of uh, being unable to service the, time, the timing constraint. This is for what real-time is. It's also important to see what real-time is not. 
because there are several misconceptions around real time. So let's take a look at those. The first one that comes up comes up quite often is the one on the screen. Let me make sure that you understand the real time kernel will not make your system real time. Not on its own. The rest of your hardware and your configuration has to be set up for it. Even the most efficient Artos, they can be useless in the presence of other latency things. And just switching to, an, to a real time kernel will not make your system real time because a kernel is only one component of a real time system. It takes essentially careful understanding and, uh, and tuning. If for each distinct system, uh, even if you have a real time capable kernel, you normally require some specific tuning. A second very common misconception uh, is that real time results in optimized performance. And usually these arises from um, some video applications that are described as real time because there's a lack of perceived latency. Usually those are just best effort systems that are performant enough to remove any human notice of deadline failures. But real time does not necessarily result in optimized performance. Uh, we are looking at a deterministic response to an external event. This is what real time is all about to minimize response latency, not optimize throughput. Also, the real-time kernel will almost certainly perform worse than uh, the other schedulers in anything but uh, task schedule response. Quite frequent is also the reference to real-time systems when what is meant is just fast. And real-time is not necessarily synonymous with fast. Um, why? Because it's not the latency of the response per se that is at issue. This could be in the order of seconds, but the fact that the system can actually guarantee uh, a bounded latency that is sufficient to solve the problem at hand. So what I mean is that it's not the value of the time requirement, but rather that there is a time requirement at all that makes this a real time requirement. So fast does not imply real time and vice versa. Of course, fast on a, relatively on a relative scale may imply the need for the real time operating system features and extreme low latency requirements are often serviced by a real time OS. But when it comes to the definition, the, the presence of the time requirements makes it um, requires a real-time OS, is not the value of the time constraint itself. So, as I said, real-time kernel is for extreme latency-dependent use cases, but what's important to add is that a missed deadline will result in failure. We are not just talking about degradation of the system. Also, sometimes you may see references to uh, real-time systems when what is meant is just online or uh, an interactive system with better responses than, uh, than previously. But this is often just marketing hype. Um, and finally, it's also not the case that real-time is always necessary. So it, it does sound uh, good for something to be called real-time, usually because of the performance connotation that I was mentioning. But you need to be extremely conscious of the consequences for a missed deadline. Do they warrant hard real time? Imagine if the deadline is in the order of seconds, that's also likely not going to be missed on a multi-gigahertz uh, CPU with proper tuning. So there's a trade-off, there's a balance to be, that needs to be, you need to strike. So how would you know, for instance, if a low latency kernel is acceptable over real time with pm 30 you need to know what your latency requirements are and the consequences for missing a deadline. Uh, based on that information, based on this data, you should then be able to make an informed decision. If you imagine uh, your latency needs uh, are very tight and uh, a missed deadline is something catastrophic, like a car brake not preventing a crash, then real time with the preemptor T patch is for you. Uh, on the other hand, if you have less stringent requirement, and um, the consequences are less dire, then maybe um, 
a more balanced solution, like a low latency kernel, uh, may be a good approach for you uh, rather than real time with pre MTRT. So, why is the definition of real time important? Because this essentially will define where real time is needed based on what real time is and what is not. So, the idea of determinism and the guaranteed bound response and the failure in case of a missed deadline, you can understand how real time has applications across broad verticals, and there are several use cases in the market where real time may be required. So here I can give you an exhaustive list of all the potential industries where you may find real time, but just I just want to give you um, a few names where you realize how the definition uh, directly affects the, the presence of real time. So uh, which scenarios require real time? The real time kernel is for those extreme latency dependent use cases where a missed deadline will result in failure, not just degradation of the system. So all the compute systems are expected to fulfill tasks within a given deadline. And if you think of the consequences of missing the deadline as catastrophic, then uh, dedicated devices like life-supporting medical equipment um, require real time, uh, or medical robots in the healthcare industries. So this is one uh, one vertical where you can find uh, real time OS with pre MTRT. RT. Um, another extremely pervasive uh, use case for real time is in industrial automation, because of the strict precision requirements for the system, and uh, of course in the in the factory determinism and real time capabilities have been there forever. As you can think of a process and discrete automation, but also to maintain to sustain production and to maintain system integrity, um, if you have an assembly line where PLCs must deliver and process data in real time, a missed deadline could compromise the entire production line. A good example may be a robotic arm that has to, to pick up something from a conveyor belt. And if the piece is moving, uh, then the robot will only have a, a small bounded window of time where the, the object can be picked up. If the robotic arm is going to be late and the piece is not going to be there, first of all, the job will have been performed incorrectly, but it may be the case that this failure will compromise the entire production line and, and with dire consequences in the factory. So this may require a guaranteed response time. Uh, so it may need uh, real time with, with pre-MTRT. There are several other sectors, from food and beverage to oil and gas and transportation, with strict um, requirements. Also in automotive, if you think of the, the latency needs being really tight um, and missing a deadline resulting in a fatal accident, then of course uh, a car brake not preventing a crash um, will uh, will uh, lead to the need for real time and, and pre -M30, or also autonomous driving. You can think of robotics with um, some systems like autonomous mobile robots requiring real-time behavior. So there are, of course, many more broader market applications than, than the one listed here. Um, some sectors like um, transportation have, uh, have their own requirements or product and the quality assurance and safety, or even high precision systems in industries like energy um, or telco, where the absolute deadlines of real time are required. Also, another example may be the servo loops in an airplane. So when uh, cruising, uh, airplanes usually go on autopilot with the sensors of the plane continuously monitoring the environment and supplying the onboard control computer with the proper measurements. If any of those measurements um, was to be missed, then the performance of the airplane may degrade to an unacceptable level, leading to fatal accidents. So again, pre MTRT may be required here as well. Um, I want to just quickly <laughs> mention something regarding the audio community. So for musicians, the real-time patch may be um, good for getting reliable recordings because jitter from mainline Linux would cause a scratching sound. 
And here I'm including an extract from an email that was sent before pm 30 before the entire project uh, started. So this is back in 2000. And back then, uh, Linux was not a preemptible kernel. And the audio community had the stringent requirements for Linux um, because of the performance of audio applications and operating on streaming digital data in real time. And uh, two developers uh, essentially tried to communicate the shortcomings of the Linux kernel back in 2000 to, to Linux. And um, the communication was titled a joint letter on low latency in Linux. And this is what led to the, to the different efforts. And one of those was preempt RT. So it's interesting to see how real time got started because of um, audio users and developers who were trying to raise the issue of uh, preemption latency to a new level. And their request was based on their desire to have Linux function well with audio and music. Um, one of, the, of the, the two authors of this letter produced some benchmarking that demonstrated that um, the back then 2.2 kernel and later 2.4, um, essentially he demonstrated that the kernel had worst case preemption latencies that were unacceptable for audio applications. From the latter, then um, it built some momentum and two efforts emerged and uh, they produced patch kernels that provided quite reasonable preemption latencies. Uh, so Ingo Molnar from Red Hat and Andrew Morton from uh, back then at university, they both produced some patch sets that provide the preemption within particularly long sections in the kernel, which then led to preempt 30 itself. So despite the broad market applications and uh, immediately one may think of industrial automation or robotics, healthcare, manufacturing, um, it's uh, at least to me fascinating to see how uh, much broader the, and pervasive real time can be and how it all got started because of the audio community pushing for increasing preemption in the Linux kernel and directly emailing uh, Linux himself. So I've mentioned preemption. And preemption is at the core of real time. If I were to summarize it in one sentence, increasing the preemptable code, code surface within the kernel is what will dramatically improve the capability to provide a deterministic response time, to guarantee a bounded interval. Let's try to understand what preemption is all about then. So imagine we have a process which is nothing more than an instance of a program and execution. Uh, as you know, this process is executing its uh, instructions in a certain address space. And when the program is executing in user mode, it can't directly access the kernel programs and the kernel data structures. Uh, of course, when the application is executing in kernel mode, these restrictions don't apply and the CPU, uh, they provide special instructions to transition from user mode to kernel mode and vice versa. So usually uh, a process is executing in user mode and then it switches to kernel mode when requesting a service provided by the kernel. The moment the kernel is satisfied the program request, then the program can go back to user mode. Why does this matter? Because an if you think of a uniprocessor system, only one process is running at a time, and it may run in user mode or in kernel mode. If it runs in kernel mode, it's executing some kernel routine. If it's in user mode, it's not. So how would the transition between user and kernel mode work? Imagine process A is starting its execution in, in user mode. At a certain moment in time, a hardware device will raise an interrupt. As a consequence of this interrupt, then the process A will switch to kernel mode and service the interrupt. Once this is done, once the interrupt has been serviced, then process A will resume execution in user mode. And it will keep doing so until a new interrupt will occur. In this case, there's a timer interrupt and the scheduler is activated in kernel mode. Then we have a process which is taking place, at which point another process, process B, is starting its execution in user mode. 
this keeps going until process B issues a system call. Only at this point, the process switches to kernel mode, and the system call is then serviced. So process B can then continue. So in this scenario, you can see that each process is sequential and has to wait for the previous one to start its in-kernel processing. And the issue with this picture is that when a user space process is requesting a kernel service, no other task can be scheduled to run until that process either went to sleep, so it's blocked, or until the kernel request completed. So, which means you can't guarantee a deterministic response time if you have no control, you have to wait for the completion of the kernel request. Process B here could not occur before process A completed, even if process B were to be of a higher priority than process A itself. Hopefully you can start to see how this will lead to the idea of preemption and real-time and bounded responses. Improving the flexibility or having the flexibility at all to preempt tasks that are executing within the kernel would help to guarantee an upper boundary. And in the early days of, um, of Linux, back with the 1.x and in 2000, when that email was written, the one I was showing before, kernel preemption didn't exist. So tasks, they couldn't be preempted once they started executing code in the kernel or in a driver, which means that scheduling can only take place after the task voluntarily suspends itself in the kernel um, or the task exited the kernel which means that making the kernel preemptable meant that while one process was running in the kernel, another process could preempt the first and be allowed to run even though the first process had not completed its processing in kernel. So we want to go from this picture to one where preemption is allowed. We want to enable a higher priority process to preempt a lower priority process even though the first process hasn't completed its in-kernel processing yet. So imagine we have a process A which entered the kernel via timer interrupt. At a certain point, another process, process B, which is a higher priority, is woken up by an interrupt. This picture differs from the previous one because the kernel is preempting process A and it's assigning the CPU to process B despite the fact that process A has, hasn't blocked nor completed its uh, kernel processing. At this point, once process B is uh, completed, process A can then resume. So you can see that the main uh, feature, the characteristic of a preemptable kernel, is that a process running in kernel mode can be replaced by another process, can be preempted while in the middle of a kernel function. And this can help in dramatically with guaranteeing a bounded response time because higher priority processes can interrupt lower priority ones. Now, this is not so easy to achieve in practice. Why? Because there's a challenge in making a preemptable kernel and that's essentially to identify all the places in the kernel that must be protected from preemption. So those are critical sections within the kernel. For instance, imagine we have uh, two processes, which could be the same ones we were seeing uh, in the previous slide. Process A here is working on some data, it's updating a certain variable, and at a certain point it gets interrupted, it gets preempted by a higher priority process, in this case process B. What would happen now if process B also changes the value of the shared data? So the same variable that process A was working on. And the moment process B completes its processing, then process A can resume. If process A now makes a decision based on the value determined by process B, you will have un unexpected consequences. Why? Because process B is changing the value of the shared data before process A gets run again. So process A will be making a wrong decision based on a new updated value determined by process B. And here we have two processes which are operating directly on common variables and making decisions on their value.
this is, could be a critical section within the kernel and we must prevent uh, pre preemption from occurring. You can see how this is a key challenge directly related to the previous picture we were seeing. Where we want to enable the higher priority process to preempt the low priority one, but at the same time we want to prevent preemption in the critical sections within the kernel uh, and identify the places where the kernel must be protected from preemption. If process A in this picture were to make a critical decision based on a value or an updated value that he wasn't aware of beforehand, you may have some catastrophic consequences in your system and then, and then a failure. So there were different approaches to try and solve um, this riddle. The first solution to kernel preemption was to uh, essentially place some checks at strategic locations within the kernel code where it was known to be safe to preempt the current thread of execution. And then these locations included um, entry and exit to system calls or release of certain kernel logs and return from interrupt processing. So throughout the years, from the early 2000s, when the issue of uh, low latency was first raised and then uh, the patches started to be developed, developers have been trying to figure out how to expand the code surface that is preemptable within the kernel while preventing preemption from occurring in critical sections within the kernel. And in mainline Linux, there are different preemption modes already available. So the Linux scheduler, it has several preemption models available. And the first one I want to mention is called preempt none. And this is the non-preemption case for server workloads. It's a traditional Linux preemption model which maximizes the raw processing power of the kernel irrespective of, the, of scheduling latencies. So it's optimized for the overall throughput for those systems that are making intense computations. Uh, you can think of a server or a scientific uh, system. It, it will or it may still provide good latencies most of the time, but the key uh, feature, the key aspect, is that there are no guarantees and occasionally longer delays will be possible. So the kernel code is never preempted and this is the default behavior in the, in the standard kernels. So the moment developers start looking at the code surface to add preemption, the preempt voluntary mode um, was, um, was developed. So this preemption mode is intended for desktop use because it provides some quicker application reactions to user input and it enables voluntary preemption points in kernel code. Essentially, a low priority process can voluntarily preempt itself even if it's in kernel code uh, executing a system call. The effect of this, uh, these voluntary explicit preemption points is to reduce the maximum latency of rescheduling and provide faster application reactions. Um, of course, the applications will then be perceived to uh, run more smoothly even when the system is under load. And the, the price to be paid for this is the slightly lower throughput of the system. So from this voluntary preemption points, uh, the preempt mode also adds preemption in non-critical sections. So this, this um, third mode reduces the latency of the kernel by making the kernel code that is not executing in a critical section preemptable. And it allows reaction to interactive events by permitting a low pri priority process to be preempted involuntarily, not like the previous preempt voluntary mode. This is even if it's in kernel mode executing a system call and even if it would otherwise not be about to reach a natural preemption point. So the main difference between uh, the last two modes we are seeing, preempt voluntary and preempt, is that preempt, um, the kernel code can be involuntarily preempted at any time. Also here, the smoothness of running applications and the reduced latency 
will result in a slightly lower throughput and a, a slight run time overhead to kernel code. This is typically for low latency desktops or also for embedded systems with latency requirements in the milliseconds range. And low latency is important because there are also other um, configuration options in the Linux kernel like the, um, the frequency of the um, ticker that together they can uh, combine with preempt, they can uh, increase the low, they can decrease the low laten the latency of the kernel, and um, it's important to then understand whether your embedded systems does require warrant preempt RT or preempt on its own can efficiently service its requirement. So depending on the latency requirements of your use case and the consequences of missing a deadline, you should then make an informed decision on which of the two options to proceed. Why? Because preempt RT is an intrusive patch set that is not fully upstream yet. So we have seen that overall to achieve a, a reduction in latency, what developers are trying to do is to make the Linux kernel preemptable everywhere by only disabling preemption around critical section. This is not easy because you may intuitively understand that it involves essentially looking through pouring over the entire source code of the kernel. You need to analyze exactly what data must be protected from concurrency and then disable preemption only at those locations. And this is what the preemptor T patch does. It tries for full preemption, including critical sections. So the kernel, except for very low level and very critical code paths, like uh, entry code, scheduler, or um, low level interrupt handling, except for those critical code um, sections in the kernel, preemptor T strives for full preemption. So it is a collection of um, uh, patches to implement a priority scheduler and other supporting real-time mechanisms that are hosted at the Linux Foundation. Um, there are other ways of implementing um, real-time in Linux, but preemptory is the de facto standard implementation. I can think of um, Xenomai is another way or, or also other approaches, but they try to have a the other solutions, they try to have a co-kernel running concurrently together with a soft Linux kernel uh, and instead preemptrt changes the kernel itself. Preemptrt, it is slowly being a mainline, it is not fully upstream yet and is what most partners, most customers usually ask for. It looks like the real-time patches for for the Linux kernel, they are slowly getting to the point of being fully upstream in mainline. Uh, in 5.15 the locking code uh, was merged and this represents uh, a bulk of the outstanding real-time patches. So there is still more real-time work to be upstreamed but slowly it's all getting mainline. And as I was saying the goal with preemptor T is to make all code running uh, in kernel mode involuntarily preempted at any time. How can we do this? By bringing most execution context under scheduler control and by replacing various locking primitives like spin locks with some of the variants um, that are aware of priority inheritance. So these variants they um, introduce a mechanism to break up long uh, non-preemptible sections and they enforce uh, interrupt threading. I want to make a point that in with preemptor T an unmounted latency would represent a bug. Uh, so this is how it differs from the other preemption modes. An unmounted latency is a bug because the patch makes the kernel deterministic it makes it preemptible to provide guarantees, to provide it a deterministic response time. So the goal is not necessarily to have the lowest uh, possible latencies, but to provide a guarantee, a deterministic response time. So without too many details, some of the mechanisms of uh, the preemptor T to, to make the kernel to guarantee a bounded response 
at least the year. Um, so, for instance, in other preemption models, in non preempt 30 world, um, we have that spin locks in the kernel are mapped uh, into row spin locks. Uh, and they are, preemption is disabled in row spin locks. The way that preempt 30 differs is that spin locks are mapped onto sleeping spin locks. And preemption is not disabled in the context of sleeping spin locks. So this is one way that preempt uh, differs from other preemption models. But also the um, uh, RT mutex, the, the mutexes in the mainland Linux kernel are replaced by the RT mutexes one, and they implement priority inheritance to avoid the priority inversion. Um, more information on all of these can be found when looking for the, um, the documentation and the technical details of the um, preempt RT patch uh, online. So, I've been discussing what real-time is all about, what are its use cases, how preemption is at the core of real-time, and uh, how preempt RT strives for the goal of full preemption. What we did in 2204 is to integrate preempt RT, which is not yet fully upstream, we integrated it into the Ubuntu 22.04 LTS kernel and we shipped a beta version of this real-time kernel. So this is a generic release for two architectures with no uh, specific platform tunings. We are looking at the best effort uh, general case configuration by which I mean that there are as many configuration knobs passed on to user space uh, as feasible. Real-time Ubuntu 22.04 LTS Beta is available and uh, you can access it for free uh, for your individual machine right now. And testing and providing feedback is actually heavily encouraged because this is what will help us to bring the beta kernel to a production level. And the more uh, um, bugs and testing on hardware you can provide, the shorter that process is going to be. So how can you access real-time? Um, we distribute the beta kernel for free for personal use via Ubuntu Advantage, via UA. This is a Linux uh, subscription which covers all aspects of open infrastructure and the real-time kernel is distributed under UA. You can find more information if you were to go on your browser and look for Ubuntu Advantage. So you can attach your personal machine to a free UA subscription by running this command. The free token, you can get it by going on the website of Ubuntu Advantage online. The caveat is that you need to have version 27.8 of Ubuntu Advantage tools. And you can check the version with the UA version. Uh, the moment you have this uh, enabled, uh, or if you don't if you're unsure about your version, you can just directly upgrade Ubuntu Advantage tools to 27.8 in, in Gem Jellyfish. So let's keep in mind that Ubuntu, real-time Ubuntu, is available for machines running 22.04. So you need to be on the latest Ubuntu to be able to enable the real-time kernel. The moment you've upgraded Ubuntu Advantage, you can just enable the real-time kernel via the command listed here. Make sure to use the beta flag to acknowledge this is a beta, it may have bugs, it's not yet ready for production workloads, and um, and then you're good to go and you can enable the kernel. Of course, try not to be on a, on a desktop running real time, as is not the target use case. Extensive testing on, the, on your side is very welcome, and if you can file any bugs, at the website that I'm reporting here, it will be highly appreciated and uh, we will uh, bring beta to a production level in a much shorter period of time if you were to consider positively impacting the Ubuntu community and filing any bugs you may encounter here. So, let's recap. I covered what real time is all about. Um, it enables a deterministic response time and uh, it strives for minimizing latency, not optimized throughput. We saw a few target use cases and applications, especially in industrial, factory 4.0, healthcare, automotive and robotics. Um, real time will be pervasive and is already being used extensively.
preemption is at the core of real time, the ability for a higher priority task to preempt a lower priority one. And um, the way preemption is enabled in the Linux kernel, there are different modes already available in mainline. We saw preempt none, preempt voluntary, and preempt. At the same time, there's another patch set, preempt RT, which is not yet fully upstream, but is already being mainline, um, which include, which implements all the necessary real-time mechanisms and strives for full preemption in the Linux kernel. And in 22.04, Canonical uh, announced a beta version of the 22.04 Ubuntu LTS kernel with the out of three preempt RT patch set integrated. The patch is um, the real-time kernel is available via Ubuntu Advantage and is free for individual use on your personal machine. You can just enable it by following these steps outlined here and you can get your free token on the website of Ubuntu Advantage. It's now time for your questions and I see you've been uh, asking them throughout the presentation on the chat. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I'm going to open the floor for questions and, um, and I'll see you on the other side.